Welcome to Burrows and Burbs with hosts John Ingle and Roberto Cabrera. Over the next hour, you're going to learn some insider knowledge that will help you overcome and strategize in the cutthroat world of real estate. Now, here are your hosts, John and Roberto. Welcome to Burrows and Burbs 89, the Brooklyn Show. I'm John Engel of Douglas Elliman in Connecticut, and that's my co-host. I'm Roberto Cabrera, and I'm with Brown Hair Stevens on the airport side of Manhattan. West 75th Street, as I recall, in Manhattan. I want to thank our sponsor, Grace Farms, found at gracefarms.org. You might know them from their award-winning architecture, the River Building, on their 80-acre campus in New Canaan. You might know them from the world-class events and conferences that take place throughout the year with the UN. But I know them from Design for Freedom, an initiative to end forced labor in the building materials that go into our homes, offices, and public spaces. Design for Freedom. How do you find out about it? Go to gracefarms.org, read about Design for Freedom, order some of their fair trade coffee and tea, and consider giving the gift of Grace Farms sips and drips as your next client gift. Use coupon code BURBS for 10% off your first order. Today, we are in Brooklyn. This is the Brooklyn Show. Jared Lafrenet met me in London and said, it's time Burrows and Burbs came to Brooklyn. And so we did. Roberto <laughs> said, if you're going to Brooklyn, we have to ask Lee Solomon. Lee is Brooklyn. And lest we make this show about realtors talking to realtors, we had to ask uh, uh, Katie Lydon, who has been on the show, I think, two, three times before and has done many designs in Brooklyn. Lisa Ben Isby, wave, Lisa. Lisa said, if you're going to ask a Brooklyn designer to be on the show, it better be Katie. So welcome, Katie. Glad to have you back. Thank so you. So with that, Roberto, where do we start? How do we start the Brooklyn show? Let's start by Brooklyn always used to be hipsters. And I'm, you know, you know I'm never going to move to Brooklyn. And I just want to know just generally from how has Brooklyn changed in even the last 10 years? Is it still for just hipsters? I know that it's got, you know, it's gotten very expensive, but, and a lot of people moved, not just necessarily to the outer burbs during COVID, they went to Brooklyn. Are they coming back? Well, I'm happy to start with that because I feel like I live in the center of hipster community, <laughs> Williamsburg, which where I believe coined that phrase hipster. And just to give a little bit of uh, credibility for myself, I've lived in Williamsburg now, this August will be 20 years. So I have watched this neighborhood dramatically shift. And, uh, and, it, and it certainly was, I, you know, 20 years ago in 2003, when I moved here, it left a lot to be desired. You know, in fact, I had like a, I had a Manhattan life and I had a Brooklyn life. If I needed to go to Chase Bank or Dwayne Reed or any clothing shopping or that, I went into Manhattan for that. And then Brooklyn was more of kind of, you know, dive bars, concert venues, everything was run down at the time. You know, in 2003, when I, when I moved here, the, the Domino Sugar Factory was still operating. So, which has now been turned over and is a huge, beautiful park along the waterfront. And really in the last 10 years, I mean, the shifts that have happened in, in the neighborhoods I'm most familiar with because of, we're living here at Williamsburg and Greenpoint. I mean, we have seen, you know, Whole Foods open up, Trader Joe's, uh, Equinox Gym, and just in the last year, which has been really, you know, kind of astounding to see Hermes opened up last week. Hermes just opened a, a three-year pop-up while they, while, they, while they build out an 8,500 square foot flagship store. Um, and wow. North, North Six, that used to be a, you know, kind of a great hangout that was all bars and concert venues and restaurants, is now Garrett Light and Warby Parker and Patagonia and Hermes and Nike, Nike. and Credo. I mean, it's 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 been remarkable what we've seen shift on the retail and restaurant and kind of. And all that's in Williamsburg. All that's in Williamsburg. The yeah. Hermes is in Williamsburg. The Hermes is in Williamsburg. It just opened last week. Wow. Is Williamsburg so hot because it's so accessible? Right over the Williamsburg Bridge. Incredibly easy. It's one stop on the L train. It puts you right back into, you know, either the East Village or, you know, the L right to 14th Street. Uh, it's an easy cab ride. We also have the ferry system, which a lot of people use. You know, the ferry picks up in three different locations in Williamsburg. So getting back to the cities is, is quite easy. 
Well, Williamsburg was um, rezoned and upzoned tremendously. And that really, you know, just jump-started things. And there's been waves of development, you know, there's that continue there. But you see larger buildings, more new residential there than anywhere else in, in Brooklyn. And also you have larger footprints to get in the national chains. Um, it, obviously it speaks to who it's attracting that it's getting the luxury chains, you know, not chains, luxury stores going in. But um, the, the rest of Brooklyn, has much smaller buildings for the most part. And so, you know, the, the cycle of, of who's coming in and when is, is different. So is it safe to say that the original top of best of Brooklyn was Brooklyn Heights and downtown Brooklyn? And in the last 10 years, that has shifted eastward and northward to, the, to Williamsburg? Or is Brooklyn Heights still the top pinnacle of Brooklyn? That, that's a good question. Um, when I first started 20 years ago in real estate, um, it was really seen as Brooklyn Heights was the pinnacle. And then the neighborhoods that surrounded it, there were kind of adjacent neighborhoods, were attracting people that that maybe found more value or better, you know, types of properties, you know, that they could afford um, in areas. Now it's funny to think of them as affordable, but Cobble Hill used to trade, you know, a bit less than Brooklyn Heights, I guess, to some degree, it still does. Um, Boreham Hill, um, Carroll Gardens, you know, and then fanning out a little bit more into downtown Brooklyn. Downtown Brooklyn um, didn't really have much for residential. Um, it, it sort of kept, it, that's an area that's had tremendous growth too, um, and some degree Red Hook, but um, that, that wasn't really connected to Brooklyn Heights so much. Um, and then you had Park Slope and the neighborhoods that were, you know, adjacent to Park Slope were, were attracting a lot of people too. We're talking about the migration from Manhattan and then to some degree the migration out of like Brooklyn Heights and adjacent neighborhoods further into, you know, further into Brooklyn, like Park Slope area neighborhoods, Prospect Heights, Windsor Terrace, um, you know, some of the other neighborhoods, Greenwood Heights became a named neighborhood. It wasn't before. Fort Greene kind of was always doing its own thing, very small footprint, had some larger buildings go in and now seems more connected because of um, the development that's happened. Um, in the area of Fort Greene that's sort of adjacent to downtown Brooklyn and downtown Brooklyn's got, got built up a bit too. Now, now it sort of feels like all of Brooklyn is to some degree merging. You can find great coffee almost everywhere. Would, would you agree, Jared? Yeah, I mean, I, yeah. I, I, I like to tell my, I, I always use this thing. I, Williamsburg is like Soho. Dumbo is Tribeca. Literally, it's converted warehouses, cobblestone streets. Brooklyn Heights, Cobble Hill is very much West Village. I look at neighborhoods and think of Park Slope being very, you know, if you like the Upper West and the Upper East, you probably feel very comfortable in Park Slope. Um, and I think that those, you know, it, it's such a big borough that it's it's also, you know, wh where do you want to live and what kind of lifestyle are you looking in each? Um, you know, so I I, I find, uh, you know, when I ask people what, you know, they they appreciate that because it's, uh, you know, it, there's such a range of a range of diversity in Brooklyn too. It's kind of more of like, what, what are you looking for and why? Can, can we talk, I mean, it's so, you know, I consider Manhattan pretty diverse, but it's nothing compared to Brooklyn. It is so diverse and so different. And uh, let's, can we just talk about just the maneuverability of the borough itself? In Manhattan, you can get around pretty easily to every corner of Manhattan. In Brooklyn, it seems so spread out and so difficult. Like if you're going to, I mean, I don't know how you would get from Williamsburg to Sunset Park or, you know, vice versa. You know, I, I don't, it just seems a lot more limiting that way. Am I wrong? No, you're not wrong at all. I, it's very difficult to traverse, especially going north and south. From getting, getting to Williamsburg to Red Hook is you need a car. Yeah. You know, so you're either you're either yeah. jumping on a ferry, which is you know really made kind of bouncing between Williamsburg, Dumbo, Greenpoint, you know, much easier. But there's no train, with the exception of the G train, that's not a great one. It's not very connected that that allows you to go north and south within within Brooklyn. So there's a yeah. lot of Uber usage. Yeah. Well, actually, I bike a lot, and that's really fun. Um, you know, you have to you have to sort of plan your trip out a little differently, but um, it makes getting around really fun. And you realize that the distances aren't that far. There's a lot of, you know, traffic that's kind of come up. That's happened more since the pandemic um, at different times of the day in, in terms of driving. So Ubering 
works, but I don't know. Biking's just really easy for me, but obviously it doesn't work for everybody. And then I take trains or walk, but yeah, I'll, I'll bike to Williamsburg. It probably takes me, you know, I don't know, 30 minutes from Park Slope and super fun. Hmm. How's so, it sort of um, LA feel in the way that LA is very distinct neighborhoods and it's quite hard to get from one neighborhood to the other, but uh, it's still a very cohesive, very, you know, very, very sort of cohesive place in that, you know, has a sort of, sometimes I think of the two of them as oddly quite similarly set out. Yeah, you're right. I haven't, I, I grew up in Los Angeles, so I hadn't put that connection together, but I, I, I can relate to that. Yeah. 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 Do you miss old Brooklyn, Jared, from like the 04, 05 to now? I do. I, you know, I, it's been meaningful to me to kind of, you know, you know, grow up with the neighborhood. It, it was really remarkable to see that, you know, when I moved to the city 20 years ago, I heard all these stories of you should have seen what Bleecker Street looked like, or you should have seen what Union Square, you should have seen what Soho. And I can now say, well, you should have seen what, what, what this used to be. You know, J. Crew used to be DFA Records, where LCD Sound System made all their hits, and and the Brooklyn, the the pool on McCarran, the McCarran pool was a concert venue that was covered in graffiti, and all the fans were in the pool, an Olympic sized swimming pool, and the bands would sit up top, and that was amazing. And I, you know, I was attending these events and not really thinking much of it. And then Mayor Bloomberg, you know, don't donated money and now the whole pool has been revamped and is polished and pretty and beautiful and back to a swimming pool. So to see, see, you know, and, and with that came, I think, a lot of very unique spaces here that that were restaurants or clubs or bars or, you know, or, or art galleries that have now we've seen come down and have turned into condos. And it's a very different kind of retail landscape as a result. So a lot of my favorite places uh, that were here when I moved here, unfortunately, no longer are. So uh, what I hear you saying is that Manhattan was is for bankers and that Brooklyn <laughs> was for artists, but maybe now the artists have been priced out of Brooklyn or have they been priced further away from the Brooklyn Bridge? I, I, I feel the artists have been priced out of New York in general. I, uh, I mean, yeah. I'll let I some of them chime in. I, mean, I came to Brooklyn um, in 86, I was Spike Lee's assistant and then moved to Fort Greene. So the, the change I've seen has been pretty incredible. Um, but what I'll say is that it sort of feels like the majority of people who come to Brooklyn, they have an interest in, in being part of something that is diverse, that is artistic, that is really fun. So even if they are, you know, bankers or working at, you know, a Googlers or whatever, it sort of seems like they're here for, for reasons that, that have to do with what's actually happening um, as opposed to wanting to. And, and that I think is, is great. And I think people do recognize the importance of, of the integrity of the neighborhoods and, you know, that, that we can be a force for good, even though we are, you know, oftentimes a big change in force as well in the real estate industry. Wait, I, I, I can't let that pass unnoticed. You were Spike Lee's assistant <laughs> in, the, in the 80s when he was making all those movies about Brooklyn, the top of his game. Could well, Spike Lee make a movie about Brooklyn now? And would it be like Crooklyn? No, I don't think so. <laughs> Crooklyn was... It's a great movie. Um, I have worked on that one, but I was really close with um, his brother and sister who wrote it, and it, it was so you know close to their to their home life. It was lovely to see on on film. Um, yeah, no, I, I I I had a lot of fun in the eighties. I had a lot of fun. Very <laughs> different. Still a lot of fun. Yeah. Um, very different. Um, but I, you know, architecturally, the the this. The things that drew me to fall in love with the area, the people, there's a lot of similarities to the way it was. There's a lot of people that are very invested in the communities um, in, in Brooklyn that went through a tremendous amount to make the neighborhoods what they are today. And a lot of them, you know, are, are people who are just very involved in like community groups and neighborhood groups and 
there's a lot of people I've just seen really put their heart and just and soul into Brooklyn. Um, and, um, and it's just, you know, it, it's, it's not just for the newcomers. It's not just a playground for the rich, although it is a playground for all of us, but we all, I think everybody needs to um, realize that the, that the culture that that's behind what's drawing you to Brooklyn is still here. You know, it's. Yeah, I, I agree with that, Lee. I mean, the, even what I've seen in Williamsburg, the community um, efforts are astounding and what they've done to fight for the park space and for the whole waterfront redevelopment and protecting park space. And I think that's a big appeal of Brooklyn is, is what we've been able to, uh, you know, create and um, preserve with, with open space and parks. Is that because there's less density? Absolutely. And, um, you know, it, the zoning, the zoning, uh, you know, encourages that in the lower density, you know, we're seeing more towers that are along the waterfront, but with that is coming, you know, you know, again, speaking specifically to kind of Williamsburg and Greenpoint, all the way from the Williamsburg Bridge to Long Island City will now be a full interconnected parkway and greenway, very similar to the West Side Highway in Manhattan. But I always tell people the great part about Brooklyn is there's no highway. Right? You, where you, where you, is that greenway going to be? That's going to run from from um, from Williamsburg. So if, if you, you can see on the from the bottom of from the bottom of Williamsburg all the way up to the top of Greenpoint. And then that also, it's it's not as connected, but it runs down through the Navy Yards there, and it connects down into Dumbo and into the Brooklyn Heights Promenade, and and a lot of that, fortunately, was was due to Mayor Bloomberg, and he, you know, the the city bought and purchased a lot of that land and and converted that to park space. That's great. Yeah, it continues Oops. down to Red Hook too. Mm -hmm. um, at this point, there's some breaks going to into Sunset Park and then to Bay Ridge. But there's some there's you know, parts that are sprouting up a little bit along there too. So you'd mentioned architecture. I'm just curious about uh, some of the housing stock. The housing stock in Manhattan, for, for the most part, when you think of Brooklyn, you think of a lot of brownstones and townhouses and things like that. In Manhattan, that makes up 3%, 4% of our housing stock. But in Brooklyn, I know it's substantially higher. Do you know more or less what percentage? And is it kind of uniformly spread all over Brooklyn or is it just primarily in certain spots? Um, I don't know the percentage. It, it varies a lot neighborhood to neighborhood. Um, still, the largest part of our, our sales and rental market are the multifamilies, you know, the condo co-ops, um, for the most part, in, in terms of our, our sales volumes. Um, it, that could relate, though, to the fact that people generally stay into, in their larger properties longer, you know, so... Are people uh, renting or buying more? What's, what are, what's the market looking like right now? It's frustrating for all, I'd say. Um, there's not enough inventory either for rent or to purchase. Um, I, Jared and I were talking earlier, you know, we're, we're still seeing bidding wars. For, I, I'd say the things that are more fixed up than not are the ones that are attracting the most attention right out of the gate. Um, but instead of like maybe 10 or, you know, seven to 15 offers, we'll, you know, we're seeing three or for everything, but a lot of things that, that are priced right. The rental market, it's hard to price because there's a lot of volume issues, you know, in, in certain categories. So a lot of times things get bid up, you know, if they're, if they're not priced, the market is really finding its level. Um, and it's a tough market. It's, it's, you know, I have a, a college graduate, so I see it from, and I'm a landlord. I see it from both ways. It's like, I, 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 I think there's frustration out there for, for all involved, I'd say, except for landlords. Landlords are okay in this market. So you guys were not, were not nearly as affected by COVID price-wise as Manhattan was. I mean, everybody was actually going from Manhattan to Brooklyn. So did your pricing stay moderately, not stable necessarily, but like it was much less elastic than I would have anticipated? I, I'd say it... I have one example. It's it's not necessarily representative, but it was very telling. You know, we were pretty much shut down until June 2020, yeah. and I had sold a house in Park Slope to um, longtime clients of mine, um, and they decided it was too hard for them to really pull off the renovation that they wanted to in the timeline they wanted to because of COVID. So they put it back on the market. Um, we we hit the market 
right out of the gate when we were allowed to you know, make things public and go on the market and show things. And um, they wanted to price it below what they had paid for it. They just wanted out to move on. Um, I said, you know, we don't know where the level is. Let's try for more. Let's at least try to recoup all your costs because obviously there's costs involved in, in purchasing selling. So we added a bit to their, to their purchase, you know, from their original purchase price. We ended up getting hundreds of thousands more than what they paid for it. That's actually not the most interesting thing. They Your microphone's cutting out a bit. Yeah, yeah Lee, we're, we're only catching every other word now. Can't hear you. Can't hear you. Mm, not sure what to do. Though. I pulled up on the screen uh, the brownstone, the classic brownstone, and it seems to suggest that the average sale price in the first quarter for a brownstone is $3.1 million. Is that accurate, Jared Lee? Is that accurate? Can I really go buy a whole brownstone in Brooklyn for $3 million? Uh, yeah. Again, I think we we have to kind of sub which which pocket of Brooklyn are we talking about? Because I want to be in Williamsburg with you. Can I get a $3 million brownstone in Williamsburg? Well, you know, and, and I think John, uh, or, sorry, you know, speaking about this earlier, even the, you know, the style of like, where are the brownstones in Brooklyn? They're not in Williamsburg. Williamsburg was not a residential neighborhood. You know, there's some that are in Greenpoint. If you go to areas like Port Green and Park Slope, those are brownstone driven neighborhoods. Okay. Um, you can still get into a townhouse in Greenpoint and in Williamsburg for $3 million. And that's that's something that that I've seen why clients are coming over from the city because, you know, that townhouse in Williamsburg that might be three to five would be twice the amount in the city and would also be probably 10 times the amount in property taxes. Um, How about Cobble Hill, Brownstone and Cobble Hill? Much more expensive. Much more expensive, yeah. yeah. I, Cobble I, Hill's a very small neighborhood and we're, and we're seeing those price points and, and especially what's happened in Brooklyn Heights over the last five years where there are homes in Brooklyn Heights that are that are selling at numbers that, are, that we see in Manhattan. But yeah. some of the neighborhoods, the housing stock, the townhouse stock are much larger townhouses than other neighborhoods. So in Cobble Hill, Brooklyn Heights, Fort Greene, the, the prime center park slope, you're gonna see homes that are for the most part, at least four stories. So you see the more modest homes um, in some of the, the areas like in the south part of Park Slope, Greenwood Heights, um, some parts of Windsor Terrace, Kensington, um, Greenpoint I imagine more than, than the center part of Williamsburg because a lot of Williamsburg has been turned over. But I, I just put something into contract recently for 2.7. Um, the ask was 2.575 in the southern part of Park Slope on 16th Street. Um, three story, two family, sweet home, some, some updates. Um, you know, if, if you want a house that you're willing to upgrade on your own, um, you could go, you could get something for around 2 million in certain neighborhoods, but a done home, you're gonna, you're gonna pay substantially more, even, even in the neighborhoods that traded for less, you know, three, four years ago. Prospect Lefferts, we see the, the two, um, two story plus English basements that are fixed up now trading for around 3 million. And, that, and that's pretty recent. So for that $3 million uh, fixer upper, what are the taxes? Jared, you mentioned the taxes, big, much bi bigger bill. I would say it's you know, probably in the range of ten to fifteen thousand a year. That's, that's not. Too, that's, <laughs> that's low. Not bad yeah, that's at all. low. Yeah, that, <laughs> that, that <laughs> same townhouse in in the West Village might be you know a hundred to one hundred twenty thousand a year. Is that one of the reasons yeah. people are are considering Brooklyn because the taxes are much less and you get more for your money? And there's so much that's going into these decisions because. The, the move to Brooklyn is is, is such a uh, it's such a positive, beautiful, magical move now, but it wasn't. You know, I, I've been a designer. I, I live in New York. My practice is a, a mu as much in New York as it is in Brooklyn, and the I feel that now Brooklyn is like this it's just completely different than it was 20 years ago. And the kinds of things that people, the kind of lives people are living there are just, it's so different. You made a very interesting So much more attractive, yeah. 
you made a very interesting distinction. You said, I, my business is in New York, but also in Brooklyn, not Manhattan and Brooklyn. You almost consider it different from New York. Oh, maybe that's just me. <laughs> I've, I've almost, <laughs> okay. No, but a lot of people but, do that. But, like you're going to, I'm going into the city and they're well, in Brooklyn. That's also the other thing about Brooklyn, you know, I think to a lot of people initially, Brooklyn felt like another state. If you lived in Manhattan and you were a Manhattanite, you were like, oh, no, Brooklyn. But now they're very intertwined and there's no reason why you can't live and work in both places. You, There's no reason why you can't have a life in both places and in you know it's it's just it's so it's it's so merged now i think with the city and it's so accessible than it in a ways that it wasn't before i don't know if anything really has actually changed but i think that everyone you know the streets the livelihood everything you know my children went to school in brooklyn heights as well and we lived at the time in tribeca and it was just it was such an easy easy thing to do yeah, I mean, I, I've had, I, in my early years in Williamsburg, none of my friends would come visit me. I would beg and play. I couldn't get a cab to take me over the Williamsburg Bridge. Right. I'd have to jump in a cab, yeah, tell them to take me towards the land sea, and yeah. then tell them to go over the bridge because they would not go to Williamsburg. Oh my God. I can now have more friends. It's like they've all come to me. And I've had so many clients even that, I've, that, that have moved to Brooklyn and thank me. I mean, I, I have one in particular and she's a close friend. She thanks me every time I see her for helping her. Find the, the, other, the other thing about it is, is that Manhattan is, I mean, not to compare the two actually, but that, that you know, they are different, but um, there is something about when you walk around Brooklyn, the trees, the, the nature, the natural, um you that you know the brown stones, the streets the light the space it's just completely um it's just really lovely and and you just don't really get that in the city in the same way that you do there and it's it's become worth it i think for, for manhattanites to to you know you know you you thought oh if you lived you live and work in manhattan you, you know work in manhattan you have to live in manhattan it's just not like it's just not it's not like that it's a very, very desirable life to be in Brooklyn, I think. And I think the design piece is, is an interesting one to think about in terms of the values too, because you know social media and the web has really evolved in a way that people are very focused on, on their homes. And a lot of the rental housing stock was updated in Manhattan, not a lot, but, it, but there's a significant amount of really nice rental stock in Manhattan. And then those people end up wanting to get more space or you know just get some home equity and looking for where you know they're where it makes sense for them to land and a lot of times if they're looking at Brooklyn they're saying to themselves well how do I get that beautiful finish that I'm I want and so they're turning to you know hopefully professionals but a lot of times you know they're everybody's just on Pinterest and on Insta and just trying to figure out how to get that lifestyle so I, I do think the design aspect of, you know, some of the some of the influencers have have made a real impact here too. Yeah. Yes, and I think also architecturally, you know, it it, it was, um, you know, some of the old brownstones had this sort of um, um, sort of heritage feeling that felt rather dark and gloomy. Now, with sort of the way that architects have rethought the brownstone a little bit, you know, in terms of taking off the back, putting glass on the back, making rooms feel really incorporated into the garden that's there, the, 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 the sort of growth in that regard of making those townhouses really come alive and brighter and happier and all that kind of thing really has, I think, also kind of inspired people actually yeah this is a fascinating wait the the migration of where people come from and where they go to is fascinating to me and i think you've touched on something very important my daughter is 26 she gets out of out of college and her boyfriend in the city has his first big job in the city he's working for a law firm and they go they rent their first apartment what I just heard you say was when they're done renting, when the young professional who starts their career in New York is done renting and wants more space and wants to own something is one of the inflection points when they begin to consider Brooklyn. 
I would imagine that when that 26 year old becomes, I don't know, 30, 35, and they're wealthier and they're ready to buy in Brooklyn, they want more space. 10 years ago, they could afford more space in Brooklyn. Now, Brooklyn's the same price as Manhattan. Yeah. So talk to me about, are they still coming to Brooklyn for more space to hire Katie Lydon to design for them some really fabulous space in Brooklyn? Or sure, is I that can, changing? I'll I, chime in on that because a few things. And for one, I think it's if you ask your 26-year-old daughter where she's likely going out, she'll probably tell you Brooklyn. You know, I think you, it, following the movement as well, you know, I, I think back 20 years ago, where all where did you go dancing in the city? It was all the west side of Manhattan. That's where all of the 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 clubs were. All, that whole movement has shifted to Brooklyn. In fact, what's happening in kind of East East Brooklyn is pretty outstanding with the clubs that have opened out there and all of these old warehouse spaces. Because I don't really know where I don't know where you go dancing in Manhattan any longer. Which neighborhoods exactly are you talking about? Like East Bushwick, um, you know. I, I can't even speak. It, it, those are parts of Brooklyn I'm not familiar with. Quite a ways out. I've been I've been to some of these spaces, but you know, you, it's been pretty phenomenal to see how many of these um, East Bushwick. That's just, that's almost Queens. There's, yeah. yeah. Well, there's Richards. Bushwick and Flatbush uh, areas. East Williamsburg has still got some fun stuff. You know, yeah. big warehouses I saw last night. So, are those areas that are further east as foreign to you? as Brooklyn is to a Manhattanite? Yeah, no, for, for me, me. for me. <laughs> there's, not, there's not residential sales that are happening that much in those areas. Um, so I, I, it's more of like, I, I mean, I'm married to a record producer, so I'll go out and see bands wherever that is, you know, times in the band. So yeah, I mean, I'm out, but I'm not doing sales there. What about uh, bed -Stuy? It used to be like, Oh, I live in Bed Stuy. And it was like this whole thing. And now I literally heard someone the other day, I live in Bedford Stuyvesant. And I was like, oh. wow, that's a change. <laughs> Just in the demeanor of how they presented where they lived. Well, that change? I read something that it was exploding or just a headline. It's it's such a beautiful neighborhood. It's a huge area. I mean, if you look at it just on the map, it's a big amount of real estate there. Um, I think that there's a lot of stuff that that's happening. It seems more connected in a lot of ways in terms of the services, um, you know, cause again, I bike. So if I'm biking, if you look, if you're biking from Prospect Park down, you know, you're going through some of these neighborhoods, just, you know, down Bedford Avenue, it's the big yellow line that, that connects down to Williamsburg. You know, there's a lot of beautiful new stuff going in and, and rehabs of older stuff throughout that that stretch. Um, but the thing with Bed-Stuy is that it underwent so much speculation. Um, we're talking way back. We're talking in the in the 80s and the 90s. There, things were just traded, you know, foreclosures, things were traded and traded and traded. And it was almost like, you know, groups of people, investors would get together on the courthouse steps and bid, and then they'd, you know, buy and sell from each other. And they held and, and did really cheapo renos and sold out. And most of them, I think, are not trading in that area anymore. But so then people fixed up, you know, it's like the layers of development. So people fixed those up. And then there's still some stuff that didn't trade in that period. And, and you know, they need renovations. So I think there's a mix of stuff that's been renovated there's some new things that have built up pretty big along Bedford stretch. And then, I don't know, it's, it's very beautiful, you know, but, but transportation is a little challenged in certain parts of Bed-Stuy. And why do they leave? I know that they go because they want more space and they want to buy and mm -hmm. they've left their Manhattan rental in search of more space and better space. But why would they leave? Uh, are they looking for greener, even larger spaces, a lawn, green space, schools? What what would cause people to move out of Brooklyn? Well, one inflection point is definitely schools. So um, the elementary schools are, for the most part, zoned. And then when you get to middle school, you know, there's sometimes fear on the part of families because they don't know where their kids can be placed until 
you know, around the springtime of um, the year before, you know, they enter middle school. So sometimes families will get nervous and, and start looking in the suburbs um, just because they don't, they, they're just stressed out. It all seems to kind of work out with the school stuff, but it's no, there's no guarantee for what spot you're going to get from middle school for the most part, unless you happen to be in a private that has ongoing or whatever. Um, and then you find some inflection points in high school. So sometimes you find what I call like the sports families who they need to have their kids like out on the lacrosse field, like five days a week. You can do it in New York, but you're going to have to be really, you know, going this way and that. Whereas in the suburbs, you know, it's sort of one-stop shopping for the sports, I think. Yeah, I agree with that. How about safety? Um, I'm going to, so a little confession here. I grew up in uh, Stuyvesant town, lower Manhattan, and I was 12 and my sister was 10 and she was playing in the park and some, she was 10 years old, and some 12 year old accosted her in the, in the park. I mean, I don't think it was necessarily a dangerous situation, but it was enough for my parents to say, that's it. We're out of here. We're going to the suburbs. One incident with their 10 year old daughter being accosted by a 12 year old boy. And they're like, yep, we're done. So I wonder, do do people um, have the perception that Brooklyn, all of Brooklyn is safe? Do they choose their neighborhood over safety and do they leave over safety or perceived safety? Yeah. I know that I, I, I just saw the Crown Heights neighborhood and I know that the headline out here in Connecticut, the only headline we ever hear about C Crown Heights is over some conflict there. So I, I just wonder whether public safety is one of the factors driving people in or out of Brooklyn. Um, I've not, I, honestly, I've never heard people really focus on that. Yeah. Um, I think that, I think that, um, you know, sometimes there'll be an incident that'll get everybody's attention. And then when I hear of something like that happening, I encourage them, you know, to just reach out to community officers or there's a monthly police precinct um, community council meeting in every precinct in New York City to go and talk to the officers or talk to community officials or community reps that are there. Um, I think that, you know, I grew up in a time, I, I, I grew up, I went to high school in lower Manhattan and, you know, I was out clubbing starting <laughs> 14 and taking the trains at two, three in the morning. I'm only saying this because my kid's behind a closed door. Um, and um, that me too, me too, back in the seventies. And yeah. I don't regard New York in the seventies as being all that safe. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I would be the only person on the train <laughs> practically, you know, and you'd be scared. Like, I hope nobody else gets in the car, but um, I don't know. I mean, I just, I, I think for people outside of New York, it's harder to put it into perspective, you know, but would I take the train at 2 a.m.? No, but are there a lot more people on the train now at 2 a.m. that are going to be fine and look out for you? Yes, you know, I don't know what to say. Are you finding people going back to Manhattan? I mean, there's got to be some, but are you experiencing that in any measurable way? And also, are any of those people the people that came out for COVID? Okay. Um, I think I've been doing this 20 years. I think I lost a couple of sets through, you know, people moving to Manhattan. I, I wish more people would move out of Brooklyn because then we'd have more listings. <laughs> <laughs> and I like knowing, I don't know, I like walking around New York and thinking of them and like, oh, this person's here, this person's there. I like everyone I put in places to stay and be happy forever. Full yeah. space. Um, Jared, you said you didn't see that COVID made much of a difference. In the no, Brooklyn market, I did not, and you know the, the best I can explain that is that in in Brooklyn, with the exception of the obvious of of the shutdowns and things, life stayed somewhat normal in the sense that we didn't have a huge mass migration. People weren't leaving Brooklyn, and I believe it was the New York Times that had an article about that, and they and they they spoke to like where what zip codes were people really leaving from? They were leaving from the West Village, Greenwich Village, Upper East. Right. Those those generally were the were the families that also had the 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 money to have a second home out of the city or purchase a second home out of the city. 
And, and I believe, you know, most people in Brooklyn or, you know, the some areas and some, some unique situations were remained here. You know, they were, they were, they stayed here through the pandemic. So I think just having a larger population of people here kept things more active. And people working from home, I think has kept, you know, our streetscapes feeling like really lively. And I, I live across from Prospect Park and honestly, it feels sort of like a carnival vibe, like a lot of days, which I find really fun. Um, <laughs> it's just always stuff going on. Um, and it, it definitely would be more like you'd see that on certain holiday weekends, but now, you know, a lot of times, you know, just break out in the middle of the day, it's fun. Um, yeah. So John, Katie, so John, can I ask, isn't it safe to say we had a lot of Brooklyn people moving to New Canaan and Darien and Greenwich during COVID? A lot of Brooklyn people, right? We did. And that's why I was wondering whether it was for the green space or the schools. I heard it's a little bit of school anxiety. And certainly during COVID, there was the question of um, wanting more green space and, and the question of, well, will I ever be required to commute five days a week again? And if you answer that question that, no, I'll never have to commute every day the way I used to, some of those people started looking at Connecticut. And I found that more people came from Brooklyn than came from Manhattan. And mm -hmm. I didn't, and, I, and I'm not, I, I, I still don't know why. I still don't know what the difference is between the Brooklyn family looking at Fairfield County and the Manhattan family. So, um, my my theory in selling in Westport is they test suburban life in Brooklyn because it's a much more residential feel, and then they experiment and come out to at least Westport. That's and what, what I, do they ask for when they get to Westport? What do they think they want the most? Well, I mean, why why do they pick Westport? And what do they ask for? A yard, more space, an easy commute. I found an easy commute became less important. Schools and taxes yeah. were still the most important thing that they asked for. And I have a question was... for Katie. What's the difference between the Brooklyn client and the Manhattan client? Are the Brooklyn clients still hip? Are they still asking for something that's a little bit more edgy? You talked about ripping off the back wall of a brownstone and making it glass. And I thought, well, that's kind of edgy. Um, Maybe you can only get away with that kind of thing in Brooklyn, and therefore that distinguishes the Brooklyn client from that happens all over Manhattan as well. And that's I, I, yeah, yeah that's I, I, don't, I think that's a that's a, a a really great way to transform a often rather dark townhouse. So, and I and I see that just as much in Manhattan as I do in Brooklyn. And and no, I I actually I don't see a huge amount of difference. I mean, I would say that i mean it's just a little thing i've noticed which is that when um you know when you're designing or decorating something in brooklyn as opposed to new york manhattan i would say that you there's a little more opportunity maybe in brooklyn to do color to just have a little bit more of that in your life sometimes Manhattan feels so extreme when you're outside it's so urban so the inside of a lot of people's homes in Manhattan is very calming and very I mean you get that too anywhere really I, I don't know that it's a real distinction but I would say there is a, a, a little bit more color and texture that's appreciated um, I, I get a chance to do a little bit more of that I find in in, in Brooklyn but no, and what, mo what, what motivates them to hire you in the first place? Are they saying, I finally bought my space and now I want to invest in it? Or are they saying, I need you to make, make sense of my space. I'm going to stay here for a very long time and it's not working for my family anymore. Can you help me reimagine my space? Do they hire you at the beginning when they first acquire a place or do they hire you to fix a, problems with a space that maybe they've already had for a while? I would say all of the above. I mean, we've worked from the ground up with major renovations and major re redos. I've also have longtime clients who are fixing this, that, and the other, or, you know, uh, it can be a, a, a lot, all, all of the above, actually. Um, you know, I don't really feel that there's a big difference, you know, in, in, 
in things you know a, a lot of design is so universal now you know everybody wants you, you, you know we're also educated and everybody there's so much visuals um reference and it's really you know you sort of it's almost like people now come to you and say you know i really love this style can we you know can, and they've really done a lot of research themselves and they really sort of think they've got this vision of what they want and so you're often um uh, it's, it's it's a slight you know, I find people and clients and everyone are, are very, very well versed in in what they want. If I can, if I can expand on that, Katie, you might see this as well. I I think that there's been a shift in the last five years where we're seeing that kind of Manhattan money come to Brooklyn. Yes, I I I would agree with that. And too. Those are the people yeah. that are saying, "All right, I can get I can get a really great townhouse for five million dollars, and I can put five into it, or do something like yeah. with a retractable roof and dig down my backyard and do you know the the kind of things that someone's doing with a thirty forty million dollar home in 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 Manhattan." Manhattan. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's right. And and I think also with the sort of, you know, Brooklyn just it just feels so much closer to Manhattan now than than it did. And it's 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 a weird thing to say, but it's it's true. And so you can, you know, and I also think that a lot of families are, you know, that would have moved to the suburbs are choosing to live in Manhattan or Brooklyn. Uh, because they can and so I, I you know I have a, a client who's got four children and they they bought this big townhouse in in Brooklyn and and you know that instead of moving out to a suburb which, which I think they might have done 20 years ago because the options would have been so limited now it's it makes sense for them to be there and it's it's uh, just the schools are great they're really close to Manhattan if they need it they can live this great life and it, it and they don't have to move out of the New York metropolitan area we're, we're also seeing a continuation of, of what happened before, but more so the Brooklyn private schools have really increased busing from throughout Manhattan. And um, sorry, uh, sorry about that. that. That didn't used to be the case. It used to be um, very rare that, that they were offering busing. And now a lot of the, the top private schools, the larger ones are, are really doing a great job with busing the kids in. And so the schools that used to be you know, pretty easy for Brooklynites to get into. Now they're drawing a lot of a lot of families from Manhattan. And then when the families, you know, end up going to a certain percentage of, of their weekends spent at, you know, parks and playgrounds and birthday parties in Brooklyn, they're like, well, we might as well just move out here. You well, know? I that that I both my I lived in um New York and both my kids are at school in pa pa uh, Brooklyn and everyone would say to me oh you'll be here in 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 a year or two we, we never did but it was always a question and and you know yeah, yeah so your point exactly yeah they're, they're, they can commute to their friends places on their own but when you're when they're younger you're spending right. a lot of time schlepping them around right yeah. right right Talk so to me about a sense of neighborhood. I look at all these pictures of brownstones and I think of in the in the old movies, everybody's hanging out outside on the front stoop, waving to their neighbor, talking to their neighbors. Is there a sense, a greater sense of neighborhood when the architecture looks like this? Or have we lost that? And it it's really um, you know, that that's just a relic of a of a different era. No, that's definitely the case. And, and I think that COVID really brought that, you know, to the fore in people's minds because people were spending a tremendous amount of time, you know, wanting to socialize and where could you do it? You know, you, you, people were confused and, you know, the stoop was a pretty big hangout. Do you hang out on your front stoop? I currently live, we own a building that um, has a cafe below it. So we live in the apartments above. We don't have a stoop. You hang out at the cafe. Yeah, yeah. Um, there's um, a great sense of neighborhood neighborliness, though. There's there's guys who you know old timers that hang out in front of the um, the uh, you know corner store. It's not on the corner, but um, you know the store a couple doors down. My dog sneaks in and grabs you know turkey from the deli, and <laughs> there's a lot of pet centric things happening here in Brooklyn too, which is a whole other thing that that you know took off even more after and during the pandemic. Um, Can we talk about the diversity of culture? Like there is the Russian neighborhood, there's the, you know, can you tell me a little bit about, about that? 
I mean, you hear every language on the playground. So it's really fun. Um, there's, you know, there, there's a lot happening. Um, and I think you, you sort of get to know people from a lot of different communities um, in, in the public schools, at least that's how I did, you know, for the most part. Um, but I think if you get involved in your neighborhood, you're gonna get to meet a lot of different people. You know, there's block associations, there's neighborhood associations, there's community board meetings, there's, you know, houses of worship, there's all sorts of stuff happening. There's a lot of different nonprofits that people get involved with and a lot of sort of ad hoc groups that form based on need. You know, there's a lot of outpouring of support for people that were relocated here during Sandy that from the Rockaways, they just kind of landed in the armory and the city dumped them here without any food, these elderly people. So everybody had to come together and figure out how to feed them because like, you know, what are we gonna do? Um, we're seeing a lot of asylum seekers um, being uh, left in different parts of Brooklyn. And now. Now, and their needs are, are not, you know, maintained, you know, by public, you know, help. So the, the groups are just forming, you know, some of them are, you know, founded at the local churches and some of them are just, you know, people coming together and saying, we've got to get these people winter clothes. You know, we've got to get them school bags. We've got to get them food on a consistent basis, you know. So there's a, there's a lot happening. On that diversity question and, and all the different sounds you'll hear on the playground, I'm wondering I'm wondering when Katie Lydon is going to adopt a, a Brooklyn accent instead of <laughs> whatever that is she has now. Um, what, what, what are, are, are you thinking about it? Because Brooklyn is Brooklyn's in. <laughs> How about you, Jared? Are you uh, is diversity an important part of the neighborhood mix in Brooklyn? Absolutely. Um, you know, I, I I remember a moment that was quite special to me because I, I live very close to the Domino Sugar Factory. And in fact, right right behind me here, I have a photo of the old changing rooms of the of the sugar factory when it was still operational. And and I've watched that turn around. And I remember the day that that park opened. It was quite a, a unique opportunity to enter a New York City park for the first time. And that day, it was every every different mix of people in person would arrived. And it was so, you know, symbolic to me. And I look around my neighborhood and I've lived on the south side of Williamsburg that tends to be more of the Hasidic populations and the Puerto Ricans and East Williamsburg, which tended to be more of the Italians and Greenpoint, which, which was more Polish. And I've had some beautiful stories of selling townhomes and that were, you know, owned by Italian families that were growing grapevines in the backyard and crushing grapes. And every time I had a showing there, I had to give myself an extra 30 minutes and I had an Italian translator and I always sat down with the owner of the home who had fresh made biscotti and espresso for me. You know, and those, those are, those are, you know, special stories to me in my, you know, in, in my real estate career. And that's the fabric of the community, you know, and, and that's what's been, what's, you know, I think we certainly see that in Manhattan, it's in Manhattan, but I feel like it's more, it's more present in, in Brooklyn. Talk to me about the parks. I heard about this Prospect Park. I'm looking at the map now. I'll pull it up. Prospect Park seems to be like Central Park is to Manhattan, but it's quite a bit far away from you in Williamsburg. So, uh, I mean, it's way down here. So I would imagine that when you're talking about Williamsburg, you're talking about that park that's wrapping along the river. So right. Williamsburg and Brooklyn Heights, and Carroll Gardens are all defined by their waterfront. And some of the other neighborhoods have Prospect Park. Like, uh, well, why don't you continue? Talk to me about the importance of parks to, to these neighborhoods as a place where people come together. Right. Well, Prospect Park was the same architect, Frederick Law Olmsted, who designed Central Park. So it has a lot. And, and Central Park, I, I cycle a lot. So Central Park is a seven-mile loop. Prospect Park is a three-and-a-half-mile loop. It has the band shell and a fantastic concert venue in there. You've got the ice skating rinks. It's surrounded by the, the library and the botanical gardens. Um, you have kind of equivalent to Central Park's great lawn. You've got a big lawn area in Prospect Park. You've got the, the, the lake there as well. Um, I mean, that is that is a well-established park that is used tremendously by the community. Whether... But if I look at Williamsburg, I see only a couple of little tiny green dots of parks. Sure. There, I don't I don't believe there's a park in any of Brooklyn that compares to the to the to the marvel of Prospect Park. 
you know, what, what shifted in, in kind of what I call waterfront Brooklyn, which is Brooklyn Heights, Dumbo, you know, the Navy Yard, Williamsburg, Greenpoint, you know, all of that that wraps around, that was predominantly, you know, especially in the Navy Yard and Williamsburg and Greenpoint manufacturing. So it was all uh, warehouse space and, and, and manufacturing, uh, abandoned manufacturing sites. So that has been really ripe, ripe for development. Um, you know, and, and again, Williamsburg specific, you know, even the Domino Sugar Factory was 12 acres of, of undeveloped land. It was mostly parking lots and things. So it, there was a lot of room to, to grow in these neighborhoods, unlike some areas like Park Slope, which were, which were, have always been residential and were much more defined. So there's so, been a great opportunity. So was it the creation of these parks that you would, you would attribute at least some of the run up in value? I mean, COVID happened, green space got valued. And the fact that that uh, you said the mayor uh, acquired all of this waterfront, made yeah. it a park, has got to have contributed to the to the renaissance, if you will, of, of Williamsburg. Absolutely. McCarran Park, where you just had your cursor over there on the top of the map, that that left a lot to be desired. And it, it is now a beautiful park. And during the pandemic, every gym I knew of in Williamsburg opened up there. There was boxing. There was CrossFit, it was yoga, there's soccer fields, baseball diamonds there, paddle ball, tennis courts. So there, there's certainly a great, um, that's that's one of the bigger parks um, in Williamsburg. And then the city just continues to, you know, expand along where we're actually building out, you know, onto the waterfront and creating more park spaces and, and the areas of the Brooklyn Bridge Park and in Williamsburg, much like they did um, along the west side of, of Manhattan. We should talk about what's on the frontier. What are the next next emerging neighborhoods? I guess, and I guess that would only be going east, right? And and each of you briefly, because we're into our last two minutes. Yeah. Thirty seconds. Yeah, you know, I'd say the Flatbush neighborhoods are getting more known. You know, Ditmas Park is very well known, and so is Prospect Park South. But there's a lot of other areas around there, um, closer to to you know, heading into Manhattan, like um, Prospect Lefferts Gardens, there's a lot of new development that's going on in there as well. There are small and mid-sized buildings, but it still gives people an entry point. Um, and then there's some beautiful old homes in that area too. It's, yeah. All right, guys, great show. We're clear on the air. Well, thank, thank you, you all. This was really great insight into Brooklyn. And uh, I'm so glad we did this. Absolutely. Thank you, thank you for having thank us. You. We should have we'll a field trip, you. invite you guys out. Yes, we'll give you a tour yeah. of Brooklyn. Love that. And I don't need a passport, right? No. <laughs> <laughs> All right, guys, thank you so much. Really appreciate it. It's fantastic. Bye. Take care. Bye. Bye, Bye Lisa.